Today's episode of The Casual Criminalist is brought to you by Crossout. More about them in a little bit. Hello everybody, it's future Simon here. I just finished recording this script and it's a good one. It's an absolute cracker. But it was originally going to go on Decoding the Unknown. So you'll hear me make references to Decoding the Unknown on it. But basically, by the time I finished, I realized that while this was written for Decoding the Unknown, it absolutely belongs on this channel, The Casual Criminalist. So that is where you are seeing it. And now, let me introduce you to Simon from about an hour ago. Thanks. Thank you to Kevin for putting this together. It's uh, The Disappearance of Maura Murray. If you're new here, what happens is uh, I'm going to read this script that Kevin has prepared for me. I've never read it before. I have no idea who Maura Murray is. And, uh, well, we're going to discover together, unless you already know. In that case, you're going to see me discover, or you're going to listen to something else right now. Either way, let's just get going, shall we? A lot of internet fads have come and gone over the years, from cursed chain letters passed via email to planking to the ice bucket challenge. There's no shortage of these internet phenomena to look back on. I remember like when I was a kid, you'd get emails and be like, if you don't pass this email on to five people, you could have bad luck forever. And, and, and child Simon Brain was like, oh my, I better pass that email on to five people I know, otherwise, well, that's bad luck forever, because children are dumb. Few of these have had a longer shelf life than Boggs, though one that has stood up to the test of time is Rick Rolling, with Rick Astley's iconic Never Gonna Give You Up, now available on YouTube in stunning 4K K quality because everything is funnier in high definition. Just look at Bill O'Reilly's face. <laughs> yeah, the story behind the Never Gonna Give You Up in 4K, they didn't film that on film or whatever, so someone used like AI to upscale it, and like, so it was, you know, essentially CSI's Zoom and Enhance but in real life, and it looks amazing. One other internet sensation that is going stronger than ever is that of the armchair detective, amateur sleuths trying to solve crimes and missing person cases from the comfort of their own keyboard. To be fair, they're not without their success stories, and Simon has already done a video over on Top 10s about crimes that were solved thanks to social media. Oh my god, I have absolutely no memory of that whatsoever. Sometimes when I'm doing the teleprompter ones, it's just like in the eyes, out the mouth. I'm like, crimes were solved by social media? I must have done that by five, like five years ago. And people are like, Simon, you did it last week. And I'm like, yeah, I did, didn't I? I'm just so dumb. <laughs> Perhaps there aren't many more successes than the, co the ones covered in that video as it published three years ago, and it's well documented that Simon is far too creatively bankrupt to resist doing a sequel to a popular video whenever possible. That is absolutely true. <laughs> the existence of internet detectives is also responsible for entertaining plot lines on police procedural shows such as the entire Netflix documentary Don't F*** With Cats. I am having... I'd never heard of that documentary until about a week ago, and I swear I've heard about it four times in separate things. And it, I'm like, what is going on? And it's not like one of those things you'd easily forget. It's called Don't F*** With Cats. As far as I could tell after watching the entire series, the show was about two internet detectives who played a major role in helping to solve a murder case, but who were unhappy with the lack of recognition they received and thus decided to contact Netflix to get the attention they so desperately demanded. We'll ignore the fact that the show did far more to increase the celebrity of the vile murderer than it did their own, and how truly disgusting and selfish the entire series was, since everything the murderer had done was for attention and notoriety, which he was being handed in spades. Still, at least we can take solace in the fact that, mur that the murdering piece of is in a maximum security prison yeah i mean okay so those guys made the documentary to get attention or whatever i've not seen it i'm assuming this is what happens um because they wanted to sell it to netflix which is also fine like i'm like yo a guy is in prison forever who's a murdering piece of according to kevin i assume so uh he's in prison forever because of these guys and if they want to cash in on a bit of that netflix money more power them Go for it! Not all crimes investigated by legions of online detectives have a happy ending, though. In fact, some don't even have an ending at all, such as the case for the disappearance of Maura Murray, often referred to as the first crime mystery of the social media age. Who is Maura Murray? It turns out that is a much more complicated question than it appears on the surface. Before I get into the details of her life, I want to make it clear that nothing being stated here is an attempt at character assassination. It's quite possible that Mora is a victim, and I don't want to distract from that. Still, it's important to have a clear picture of her and her mental state leading up to the disappearance as possible. Sorry for getting all serious on you there. I'll try and make my next aside more comical in nature like normal. Maura was born on May the 4th, 1982. 
May the fourth be with her. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, don't even like Star Wars, but I know that one. You seek Yoda. In Hanson, Massachusetts, to parents Fred and Laurie. She had an older brother, Fred Jr., two sisters, Kathleen and Julie, and a younger brother, Kurt. In case that didn't make it clear, she was from an Irish Catholic family. It didn't, but now I know. Are these like super Catholic names or Irish Catholic names? What's her name? Maura? I don't know. I'd get, I, I don't know. I don't know Catholicism particularly well. Uh, there's a Pope dude, right? Her parents divorced when she was six and Maura lived primarily with her mother. But her father, wait, <laughs> Irish Catholic family, you got divorced. They're going to hell. <laughs> Is that how it works? Catholics can't, are not supposed to get divorced or something, right? Isn't that how it works? Isn't that why the, there was the whole Protestant thing? Oh my God, my history knowledge is bad. But her father was still a major part of her life, including at times as her track coach. She and her sister Julie were great friends, but they were also very competitive with each other when it came to athletics. Maura excelled at both academics and athletics, and seemingly at a pick of colleges. When she received her exception to the uni ex acceptance to the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York, it was an easy choice for her, especially since Julie was already attending her freshman year there. I suspect Simon may know some of this, but for our international viewers, West Point is a pretty big deal. Yeah, this is where all the military officers get trained, right? I'm not sure for which branch of the service, maybe all of them, maybe one of them. I'm not sure, but uh, I know it's very competitive. It's a competitive school accepting less than 10% of applicants, and it offers a free top-tier education, room, board, books, medical and dental care, as well as a monthly stipend for other expenses. What? Hang on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does. But all of this is like, yo, you're going to have to serve in the military afterwards, which is, uh, that's kind of a cost, because you might die. Like, I'm pretty sure uh, there's... I can't remember how it is, but you can, I mean, university in the UK is not free anymore. It was very cheap when I went. It was like a thousand pounds a year or something. Uh, very cheap. I mean, like, that is, no, that is very cheap for a full education. Like a thousand, I, I always have to preface that because I'm like a thousand pounds is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money for a year's worth of education. I think nowadays it's like nine grand or something, which is a huge jump in 10 years. Oh my God. When did I go to, did I go to university in 2005? Oh my god, I'm so, that that now I feel I'm like ten years. No, no fact, boy, you were well out of university ten years ago. Um, and now it's like nine grand. But it, the year after I went, it increased to three, which was a major jump. And a lot of people didn't take a gap year in my year. Normally, people take a gap year in the UK, or well, not normally, but a lot of people do before going to university. But I remember thinking like, yo, if I take a gap year, university is going to be nine grand overall uh, over three years rather than three. Which, I mean, that seems like a lot of money. That's a lot of money to, to save. So I did it afterwards. This, what, why are we talking about this? Oh yeah, West Point. It's free because you got to serve in the military. And I think like in the UK, if you sign up to do so many years in the military after university, they'll pay for your university and stuff like that. Something like that. I don't know. How can a school in the United States offer such an amazing deal? You may be wondering. Easy, because you're not a student. You're a cadet. You're now a member of the US Army. But still, it's a really good school. By all accounts, Maura was the perfect all-American girl. She began her degree in chemical engineering at West Point, but withdrew after three semesters. One day when the students were on a trip to Fort Knox, Maura was caught stealing makeup from the commissary. <laughs> this was If I went to Fort Knox, that's not what I would be stealing. This was They keep gold in Fort Knox. Do they still, or is that just in movies? This was described as being out of character for Maura, but it was the seventh time she was brought before the disciplinary committee in 2001. <laughs> Totally out of character, <laughs> except for the other six times. This time, there was enough evidence for Maura to be brought before the Cadet Advisory Board, and in January of 2002, the decision would be announced that she would be forced to withdraw. If expelling a student for shoplifting a few dollars worth of concealer seems a bit harsh, remember these are U.S. Army cadets and are held to an extremely strict ethical code. Maura transferred to the University of Massachusetts Amherst to study, to study nursing. Yeah, of course. Like, if you're shoplifting, you're not going to get expelled from a university, unless you're in the military then they'll be like yo we own you bitches. like you are you're in the military it's like however long you signed up for you're ours and if you steal you're out which sounds like a good way to get out of the military but then you can get like dishonorably discharged and stuff which that, that looks really bad i didn't realize that that was like quite as bad as it as it is on a cv 
Maura stayed busy in her first semester at UMass. Aside from the requirements of the nursing program, she took on two part-time jobs, was able to quickly make friends, and also had a long-distance relationship with a boy named Billy, another West Point cadet who she had begun dating while she was attending the school. Maura and I are the same age. Oh, there you go, Kevin. Now I know. You're, you're 30 this... 30 this... Oh, God, again, I'm feeling so old. Kevin, you're 40 this year. Happy birthday surprise and a lot of people i went to high school with attended umass amherst i was hoping to be able to provide more insight into who she was as a person than is generally available but unfortunately no one i reached out to had known her in school i have a friend i did have a friend who worked for campus security the same job mora had so while there is an extremely high likelihood he knew her he's also a compulsive liar so it wasn't worth trying to contact him over this <laughs> sounds like a great friend also to be fair you know, university, what, was, uh, let's say, 20 years ago for Kevin. Um, I had university 15 years ago, basically. If someone asked me, did you go to university with this person? I don't know. I met hundreds of people at university. There were hundreds of people in my like halls of residence, in my classes. And people would be like, you were in the same hall as them. And you took the same class. And I'd be like, okay. <laughs> doesn't mean i remember them does it it was a long time ago and they obviously didn't make an impression they probably don't remember me they could be watching this video right now and be like who's that i went to university with that guy <laughs> i didn't even know once again mora appeared to be a dedicated hard-working student but it didn't take long for things to turn take a turn for the worst in november of 2003 one of the residents of mora's dorm noticed a number of unexplained charges on her credit card from local restaurants uh oh <laughs> how long can you get away with that for like oh god it could be a while i don't i know i i know i should and uh i just don't know you know it's like check your bank statements and it's like i don't know, just don't do that i know i should i just don't and also i don't know mostly i just use this app like um for spending and every time i spend money it's like doo -doo -doo. so if someone was spending money uh, and i was getting notifications that oh someone bought something at a restaurant i'd be like that's not me is it but back in the day I definitely wouldn't know it would take a lot it would be like i'd go to the atm and i wouldn't have any money and i'd be like oh god <laughs> i don't think that was all me or maybe it was she contacted the police who in turn contact the restaurants the next time an order was placed to pinocchio's pizza using the credit card the police followed the delivery driver to mora's door really you're using a stolen credit card to get delivery food to your house i thought you got into west point are you dumb i'm sorry i just after she signed the re receipt, the police came in to arrest her. She eventually admitted having found the credit card number on a receipt in the bathroom and used it to buy food. That sounds absolutely insane today, but in 2003, this, technolo this technically may have been possible. Federal legislation was passed in 2002 that limited the number of digits on a printed receipt to the last five of the credit card number, but businesses had until January of 2004 to comply. This was absolutely a thing in the UK. But it was... I worked in a supermarket every time you sold something you'll be printed two receipts one goes in the till and one goes to the customer the one that goes to the customer has the digits starred out except for the last four the one that goes in the till has all of their credit card information on so if you just w took out that whole thing of receipts you would have that many people's credit card information which seems insane today because boy is that insecure and just one dodgy employee who doesn't understand that they're going to get caught could just walk away with all of those credit card numbers and bought tons of shit. I, remember, I, I only found out about this because um i can't remember what it was like for some reason we needed to someone bought something and then it didn't go through on the till they'd already paid and then they'd left and my boss was just like well just pull out the receipt and just punch in their credit card numbers again and charge them for it and i'm like wait say, saying that now that doesn't sound like it should be allowed <laughs> Let's just say allegedly that happens. <laughs> no one cares. This was like 20 years ago. The most striking thing about this arrest was Mora's mugshot. Obviously, no one looks good or happy in a mugshot, but Mora's picture was more than that. Every other picture I can find of her shows her happy and smiling and looking like an average, cheerful person. Are average people cheerful? <laughs> I don't know. I was just thinking about that myself. If there wasn't proof that this mugshot was her, I honestly would not have recognized it as the same person. She looks like she's ready to choke a bitch. Holy shit, Kevster. I don't just mean that she looks unhappy, which is to be expected of someone who was just caught committing credit card fraud. She looks straight up threatening. I'm not implying that Mora was actually dangerous in any way, but this picture seems to suggest a darker side of her psyche of than what people normally saw. I'm kind of disappointed. Is the, there's no picture. Kevin sometimes includes pictures for me. And then I could be looking at her scary ass face. You failed me with that 
Anything. You may be thinking that credit card fraud and identity theft are serious crimes, and you'd be right, but there's one thing you're not taking into account, and that's the fact that the perpetrator was an attractive white girl. Also, the total credit card charges were under $250. In December of 2003, Mora was ordered to pay back the stolen money and issued a continuance. I don't know what that is, and she was told that the charges would be dropped if she stayed out of trouble for three months. But would the girl who couldn't resist trying to shoplift from Fort Knox be able to deny her unsavory urges all the way in? until March. I recently discovered in another video I made that a suspended prison sentence, at least this was UK law, means that if you commit a crime um, during the suspension of that sentence, the, suspend the sentence becomes active. So you could be like on a suspended sentence for like assault. So they're like, you go to jail for one year, suspended, so you don't actually have to go to jail. But if you like shoplift during that year, then you have to go to jail to serve the one-year sentence and i'm like oh boy is that uh like normally i'm pretty incentivized not to commit crimes because you know you get punished for crimes but if they were like yo you do one naughty thing and you go to prison for the previous crime that you basically got away with i'll be like i'm just gonna stay home just in case i don't in just in case i accidentally commit crimes i'm not gonna drive in case i speed i'm not gonna do anything i'm just gonna stay at home and sit on my hands her final weekend. Mora was scheduled for a late night shift at the security desk in one of her dorms on Thursday, the 4th of May 2004, into Friday morning. Wait, I, d I, know, I know that she didn't get really punished for this crime of like stealing the credit card numbers, but should she? And she didn't, she can't, she shouldn't get expelled for it. But should she really be keeping a security job? That seems like a job she could have after being a criminal. It was an uneventful night, except for her taking a few personal calls on her cell phone, one from her older sister Kathleen and one from her boyfriend Billy. At 12.40 a.m. Friday morning, Maura received a phone call that was traced back to a campus phone. Around 1 a.m., Maura's co-workers saw her sobbing uncontrollably. They called the supervisor, and by the time Maura stopped crying, she was just staring blankly, completely unresponsive. When asked what was wrong, all she could do was point at her phone and say, my sister. Her supervisor offered to keep her company, but Maura said she would be fine and just wanted to be alone, and that her roommate was home anyway. She didn't have a roommate. The contents of the phone call with Kathleen were not known until October of 2017? So that's a long time! 2004 to do that as a four, five, six, that's 13 years! Okay, <laughs> did Snowden leak this? Uh, when she finally gave a public explanation, Kathleen had been in a rehab facility for alcohol and drug abuse and had been discharged that day. Her fiancé, uh, Kathleen's fiancé, the sister, was a piece of sh allegedly, in my opinion, <laughs> who was not supportive of her sobriety and stopped at a liquor store on the drive home from rehab. Holy sh**. Yeah. Agreed. That is a massive piece of sh move. Yo, if your husband, wife, friend that you live with, etc., wants to give up drinking and is struggling with it to the extent that they need to get help in rehab um how about you don't have any booze in your house how about you don't drink around them and if you want to go out drinking go out drinking with your mates that's fine not saying you don't have to drink anymore but how about you don't do it in front of the vulnerable person is that too much to ask how about <laughs> the difference between and then and then stopping at the liquor store on the way home from rehab you shitting me that's insane Kathleen had told Mora that she relapsed on alcohol and pills. Billy never said what his phone call to Mora was about, but the call was only seven minutes long. To this day, nobody knows who made the phone call from the campus phone or what it was about, but there's some truly dark speculation about that night that we'll get to later. So it was someone telling her that her sister had died? Did she overdose on this? Did we say that? She'd relapse. No, she'd just relapse. We don't know if she died. Okay, I don't know. Well, I guess we'll find out, or we'll at least speculate into it. There was a major snowstorm, and classes were cancelled at UMass on Friday. There's not really any information about what she did on Friday, but Amherst is a college town in the middle of nowhere, so if the snow was bad enough to cancel classes, then she probably stayed home. Saturday morning, Maura's father, Fred, picked her up to go car shopping. Maura's eight-year-old Saturn was in rough shape and always breaking down, and she needed to be able to drive to get to her clinical work for nursing school. It wasn't unusual for her father to come spend at least one weekend a month visiting her at college. I guess old habits die hard for divorced fathers. Maura hadn't mentioned that her father was coming or that she was going car shopping to anybody. That's not unusual by itself, because it may have been a surprise for her. Afterwards, that would be an awesome surprise. We're gonna buy you a car. Be like, holy sh**, really? Sweet. Afterwards, they picked up Maura's friend from the track team, Kate, and went out to dinner. 
Neither of them mentioned anything about car shopping in front of her. Now, that is unusual. I can't imagine being a 21-year-old with a beat-up car that always breaks down, being surprised with a t- trip to a dealership for a new car, and not immediately telling my friends when I saw them. Yeah. Uh, how long could you possibly be ca- keep silence about that? You'd be like, it's a very exciting purchase. Especially as like a young person. I mean, even now I get excited about getting a new car. And I'm like, ooh, what features does it have? <laughs> if I was like 20, I'd be like, oh my God, let's go for a road trip immediately. Let's do something fun. After dinner, Fred drove them to a liquor store to buy alcohol for a party Maura's friend Sarah was hosting. Fred sounds like a legend of a dad. Not only is he buying you a car, then taking you and your friend out for dinner, he's also like, you guys want to have some booze for that party later? You'd be like, yes, dad. <laughs> Are you kidding? Like, yes? And he's like, I'll buy that for you. Legend. The strange thing about this is that he initially told the police that he waited in the car, but he later changed the story saying he told them inside the store to hurry up. It's confusing and seems like a stupid thing to possibly lie or omit details about, but it was not Fred's dumbest decision. I don't know. If I, I guess these kids, his daughter's like 20, right? Or something like that. So she's in America, so she can't buy booze until she's 21. So I'll be like, no, 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 I definitely didn't buy booze for my kids. <laughs> it seems like a reasonable reason to lie. After, Although if my kid was missing or whatever, I'll be like, F- it, do what you want. Just here's all the information. After they bought the alcohol, he drove back to the motel where he was staying and let Maura and Kate borrow his brand new Toyota Corolla to drive to the party, but he insisted she return the car later that night. Okay, I don't know if I'd do that. I'd be like, here's a bottle of booze and here's my brand new car. Drive safely. Bring it back once you're faced. <laughs> don't let, don't be out all night with it. Don't get, d- just drink, drive it home. Okay, go on. From the party that they just went to stock up on booze for. Yes. <laughs> okay, Kevin, exactly the same thing, I think. Against Kate's wishes, an intoxicated Maura left the party at about 2.30 a.m. to return the car to her father as promised. But not before driving straight through a T-intersection, colliding head-on with a guardrail and causing almost $10,000 worth of damage to the car, totaling it. The response, <laughs> the dad's like, look, we're not going to car shopping anymore. <laughs> I've changed my mind. I, I, okay, I take what I said back about Fred. Like, he's a legend. He does these nice things. But it's like, yo, 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 Fred, how about being a little bit more responsible? Mm? Mm? I know it's cool. I know you're tr- he's probably he's divorced. He's trying to be the cool parents. But uh, we took things too far, Fredo, didn't we? The responding police officer filled out an accident report, but there is no documentation of any field sobriety test being conducted. It's unclear whether the officer was extremely busy, extremely lazy, extremely incompetent, or if Bora was able to somehow persuade him. Oh my. She got back into her father's motel and stayed in his room the rest of the morning, calling her boyfriend from Fred's cell phone at 4.49 a.m. Billy said that she'd called about wrecking her father's car and that he told her to calm down and get some rest. As for the party itself, the details are a bit hard to pin down. Initially, both Kate and Sarah said that they did not remember who was at the party, what happened, who Maura talked to, or if she left with anyone. It was as if they had completely blacked out. Oh my god. Okay, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been fairly drunk in my time and it's been to parties and like, oh, were you at that party? They're like, yes, you were at the bar. Yeah, I think so. But then I didn't get in my f-ing car and drive anywhere. <laughs> Good lord. Over the years, more has come out about the party, but a lot of the people involved have lied to journalists, and so it's muddied the waters. The main takeaways from the party seem to be that Maura took one of the guys at the party back to her room, and that the police have already ruled out that that person and that the police already ruled that person out as a suspect. People love to obsess about the party, especially because it was shrouded in so much mystery for years, but seeing as it's not really our business who Maura chose to sleep with, we can probably let it go. There's a perfectly understandable reason why her friends may have been so cagey about revealing details of the party that doesn't implicate them in anything nefarious, but we'll get to that later. I'd also be being interrogated about this party and be like, okay, we need to know who's at the party. It's like, I don't know. We're not asking! They tell us who was at the party be like i just don't remember how do you know i was just i was really drunk officer i'm sorry i just don't remember i don't remember it at all late sunday morning fred finally learned about the damage to his car his brand new car turns out he was pretty chill about it remember car buyers gap insurance is your friend wait what's gap insurance he rented a car so he could drive back to connecticut for work the following day oh my god fred you know what you're too nice i mean i get you you want to be the cool parents but holy shit, i want to be a cool parent but if my kids wrecked my car i'll be you're not having a car for at least a year and uh you need to not drink and drive i don't know what i would do i'm just thinking this through for the first time now but there would be 
consequences. At 11.30 that night, he called Mora to remind her to obtain accident forms from the RMV. It's like the DMV, but we have a different name because we're Massachusetts. Oh, okay. Department of Motor Vehicles, I know that one. What do we call it in the UK? Oh my god. I don't know what it's called here in Czech. I don't know what it's called in the UK. DVLA! Department of Vehicle something agency? <laughs> I don't know. And they agreed to fill out the forms together the next night over the phone. <laughs> it's like, does insurance cover the car if you're fed up? Like, if I drive my car and crash it, I don't, I feel like, and I fail a, a sobriety test. I feel like the insurance company are going to be like, mate, f you. We're not paying for that. Shit. You got drunk and drove your car. I don't think insurance would pay for that, would it? Although this is America, people drink drive all the time, which blows my mind. Now, just before we get into the rest of today's video, let me tell you about today's fantastic sponsor, Crossout. Crossout is a free-to-play vehicle shooter game where players build their own vehicle and pit themselves against other players' creations. Now, Crossout is one of those supposedly customizable games where it's like, yeah, 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 you could definitely customize it. And in reality, that means you get to choose the type of ammunition in one of the guns. No, no, no. I play Crossout. I play Crossout a bunch. And uh, basically, you get like a frame, which is literally a frame. It looks like some girders that have been stuck together. And then you build your craft on top of that. You put the wheels on, you put the body on, you put the turrets on, you put the engine on, everything. You can make it crazy. You battle other people who also have these crazy things that are way crazier than yours. And uh, yeah you go to war against other people and if you've built a good tank or whatever you are i guess they, they are tanks if you build a good tank then it's going to succeed and if you don't you're going to get absolutely annihilated which is uh well they're both pretty fun it's a super fast paced game with lots of different game modes and you've got pretty much limitless freedom to create oh yeah another good thing about cross out is it's not super complicated like you, can, you might think oh, how am i going to build this it's not it's not really hard you just go and you bolt it all together and then you can go out and play it's very easy to get started but also as you get a bit better the game kind of grows with you so there are you know it continues to be a challenge and it continues to be fun and best of all, it's a totally free-to-play game available on PC, Xbox One, or PS4, so lots of options for all different types of gamers. And right now, you guys can visit the link exo.link forward slash exo casual criminalist. Wow, that's a hell of a link, guys, which I will also include below for your convenience. And by doing that, you'll get a free bonus starter set with three extra weapons or a powerful vehicle cabin. And now back to today's video. The Disappearance Mora's actions on Monday, February the 9th, 2004, were peculiar to say the least. Shortly after midnight, roughly an hour after speaking to her father, Mora searched MapQuest. Oh my god, this is 2004. For directions to the Berkshires and to Burlington, Vermont. Her search history showed a number of pregnancy related search queries, including Duramorph, morphine, epidural anesthesia, phenogren, and Braxton Hicks. What is going on? A professor? later claimed years later that this had been an assignment in one of her nursing classes to look up pregnancy related terms and then email them to their classmates <laughs> okay it would be convenient and make sense but there's no evidence on a computer of these emails that we know of and there were two other specific items in the list that make me question this the first was brca1 gene short for breast cancer gene one uh, Mora's mother died of cancer in 2009, so it's possible that she had already been diagnosed at this point, and Mora was worried around about the hereditary implications. The other odd search item was Nubian. If she did just what's Nubian? If she did suspect she was pregnant, I'm guessing she also suspected who the father was, and it was not the white as snow Billy. I don't know Nubian. Should I know what that means? This st the state police also said that Mora had done a number of searches regarding the effects of excess drinking on unborn fetuses. Okay, look. <laughs> she thinks she's pregnant. This isn't some nursing class thing anymore. This got way too specific. Although, I want to, like, I, whenever I look through my search history for whatever reason, I'm always surprised. I'm like, when the f*** did I search that? <laughs> Whether she suspected she was pregnant or not, it is important to note that she was taking birth control pills, and there is no other evidence that she was pregnant. The first reported contact Mora had with anyone on the 9th was at 1pm, which isn't that surprising since we know that she was up past 4am on her computer, and classes had once again been cancelled because of snow. Billy had been calling her all day, but she didn't answer. She sent him an email at 1pm saying, I love you more, stud. I got your messages, but honestly, I didn't feel like talking much of anyone. I promised to call today, though. Love you, Mora. F*** 
talk to beers when you really need them to know you care, tell them with an email. She made beer, do beers make diamonds? Although I don't know, like diamonds are just, I don't know, I, I, diamonds are such a con. Um, but emails like, it's more sentimental, it's more touching, write a letter, that's nice. She then made a phone call to inquire about renting a condo in Bartlett, New Hampshire. Her family had vacationed there and rented from this condo association in the past, but nothing was booked during the school. She then emailed her work and teacher to let them know that she would be out of town for a week because of a death in the family, and that she would let them know when she returned. Of course, there had been no death. At 2.05, she called a phone number about booking hotels in do Vermont. It was a pre-recorded it was pre-recorded information, so there was no person on the other end of the line. She then called Billy and left him a voicemail, promising that they would talk later. What is going on with you? <laughs> Why are you suddenly going off on some crazy like I might be pregnant, now I'm gonna go stay somewhere adventure? At some point, either during all of this or directly after, Maura packed up her entire room, including the artwork on the walls, and everything was placed neatly into boxes on her bed. It was reported that there was an email between Maura and Billy that was printed out and placed on top of the boxes regarding Billy having cheated on him months before, but there is some dispute as to whether or not this is accurate. The main point of contention seems to be that the original forensic examination of Maura's room and laptop were done by the UMass police, who were deemed unqualified to make the sorts of judgments that they did. I disagree with this because the UMass police are police. Police know how to do this sort of stuff. It's fairly basic. This isn't like campus security that's all or mostly students. The campus police are sworn police officers with jurisdiction on the school campus and some surrounding areas. They may have been too quick in asserting that Maura was pregnant, especially given that she was a nursing student, but I think they're more than qualified to tell me what a piece of f***ing paper says. Yeah, they'd log it into evidence. There'd be a paper trail of this. We can't question it reasonably. At approximately 3.30, Maura drove off campus in her satin with toiletries, textbooks, some clothes, and her birth control pills. She's probably like, oh man, I could be driving a new car right now if I had got totally faced and crashed my dad's car. Disappointed. At 3.40, she withdrew $280 from an ATM, and the camera from the ATM showed she was alone and does not appear to be panicked or stressed. Oh my god, that's a lot of money. I can't... I, def, as a student, I'm like, that would be... I don't know, not most of the money I have in my bank account, but a large chunk of it. She went to a nearby liquor store and spent about $40 on Irish cream, Kahlua, vodka, and boxed wine. It's uncertain where she was running to or where she, what she was running from, but one thing was for damn certain. She intended to be wasted for as much as it's possible. Sounds like she's having a party of some kind, but she hasn't invited anybody. At some point, she picked up the accident report forms from the RMV that she promised to do on the phone that night with her father. Somewhere between 4pm and 5pm, she started her drive north. Her final intended destination, if she had settled on one, remains a mystery. At 4.37, she checked her voicemail, and that was the last recorded use of her cell phone. In Woodsville, New Hampshire, a bit after 7 p.m., a resident heard a loud thump outside. She looked out the window and saw a car up against a snowbank along Route 112. The car was facing backwards. <laughs> Have you had another car accident in like three days? Come on. What is wrong with you? At 7.27 p.m., she called the sheriff's department to report the accident. The roads were still really bad from the recent snowstorms, and the road that she'd been driving on was particularly treacherous with numerous sharp turns. At some point, she seemed to have lost control of the car, slid off the road, and collided with a tree. <laughs> You're never gonna drive again. I've never had a major car accident, touch words, and... I thought that was all superstition. I'm not superstitious. I don't know why I do that. If I'm gonna have a car accident, I'm gonna have it. Uh, I've had a few bumps and scrapes, but nothing major. If I had one in like two, this one accident, two accidents in like three days or two days, I'd be like, let's not drive for a little while, and let's maybe take some extra lessons. When the car finally stopped moving, it was facing the wrong direction on the road. The windshield was cracked, and both airbags were, were deployed, but overall, the impact doesn't seem like it was that bad. As someone who spun out on black ice and sat there helplessly while my car did a complete 360 before colliding headfirst into a tree, I can say that the damage to my much larger car was far worse than the damage to her sedan, and I was only going 30 miles per hour when I spun out. Yeah, I hate driving on ice. It's so scary, and you're always like, slip in and you feel the car being like and it does like that weird braking sh and you're like ah 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 i don't like it also i grew up in the uk learned to drive in the uk where it's like it's like it doesn't really ever get that cold and now where i live in czech republic it's like you'll be driving down those back roads and be like minus 10 and everyone's just driving along like super competent driving in the ice and i'm like oh, i'm gonna die <laughs>
Another local resident, Butch Atwood, was driving a school bus home when he came upon the accident at about 7.30. He asked Maura if she wanted uh, him to phone for help, but she asked him not to and said that she had already called AAA. One police report also used the term pleaded rather than asked in regards to Butch's account. He knew that she was lying because this was a remote, mountainous area in early 2004, so of course there was no cell phone reception. Indeed, AAA had no record of any such a call. He called the sheriff's department when he got home at 7.43 three to record the accident though he could no longer see mora or the car from his house butch later expressed a lack of surprise that she didn't accept his help because he was an unshaven six foot tall 300 pound stranger rolling up on this girl in a school bus yes i wouldn't have taken your help either yeah to be alone out there uh, it's gotta be scary right i mean i'd be scared and i'm a dude at 7.46 p.m., a Haverhill police officer arrived at the scene, but Mora was nowhere to be seen. Inside the car was a AAA car, so the blank accident report, po- report forms, gloves, CDs, makeup, diamond jewelry, driving directions to Burlington, Vermont, a favorite stuffed animal, a book about climbing the White Mountains called Not Without Peril, and the damaged box of red wine. There were stains. There were red stains outside of the car, including on the ceiling, which were believed to be the wine. Uh-oh. Have you been drinking that box wine? while you're driving along a day after having a ten thousand dollar accident in your dad's car because you were wasted um at that point you, that's not like i need to practice my driving that's like wasn't her sister in rehab so probably genetically in the family you need to uh, get some help there if you're if you <laughs> if you're drinking and driving i feel like you need help if you're drinking and driving and crashing car twice in two days you need like it's unquestionable if you crash your car because you're drunk you need help the box of wine appeared to have been opened before the crash and there was an empty beer bottle in the car and butch had reported that she seemed intoxicated and mumbling missing from the car was more as debiting credit card cell phone and the bottles of liquor that she had purchased none were located or ever or used ever again none of the traceable stuff anyway i'm sure that the vodka was put to good use the police office and butch drove the police officer and butch drove around looking for more uh, but they didn't find anything. There was an alleged sighting of someone matching Mora's description traveling on foot down 112, about four to five miles east of where the accident occurred. Unfortunately, the report didn't come until three months later when the contractor that allegedly saw her was renewing his records and realized that the night he saw the young person on the road was the night of Mora's disappearance. That night, the police did not issue any sort of missing persons report. They were operating on the assumption that it was a drunk driver who fled the scene of the crime and that she would return once sobered up. This is a surprisingly common occurrence in drunk driving cases because driving under the influence is a much more serious crime than fleeing the scene of an accident. Oh, it's hard to fault the police on this decision. They saw a crashed car with spilled and empty liquid containers, valuables left inside the car, and a witness who says the driver seemed intoxicated, and they, as they say in medicine, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. They say that in medicine? <laughs> I'd say they say that in, like, I don't know, day-to-day life. <laughs> I'm just trying to for a clever example, but that's all I got, because I'm not that clever. Um, Yeah, this... I can't fault the police at all. It's like, yeah, of course. If I saw a crash car with booze spilled around the inside and no one there, and I knew that this often happens because the driving thing is less, uh, the running away is less serious, I'd be like, yeah, okay, we know what happened. Let's just wait here till the person comes back. The problem is that I'd, I'd definitely, if that was me, but it wouldn't because I'm not this kind of idiot. Um, I'm my own kind of idiot. I'd be like, okay, let's go away. Hide, from, hide in the forest for a few hours, sober up, and then go back to the car. And they'd be like, no, no, I don't know what happened, officer. I got a banging headache, though. <laughs> Around 12.30 the next afternoon, the police issued a bolo for Maura Murray. She was reported wearing a dark coat, jeans, and a black backpack. This was a little late for my liking, but I understand they wanted her to have a chance to sleep it off in case she had been trying to avoid a DUI. Big brain. At 3.20 p.m., the police called Fred Murray to tell him that his car had been abandoned. I've seen some wild conspiracy theories about the police being involved in Maura's disappearance based on the fact that they put out a bolo for her despite the fact that they never saw her car her and the car was registered in Fred's name, and I'd like to dispel those right now. Butch saw the driver was a female. There was makeup and jewelry in the car, and there was a triple A card with her name on it. To anyone who proposed that theory, I suggest you give up your career as an armchair detective and perhaps try your hand as an armchair quarterback instead. 
Anyway, Fred was out on state business and he didn't get the call, so at around 5 p.m., one of his other daughters contacted him to let him know of the situation. He immediately contacted the Haverhill Police Department and was informed that if she not, was not reported safe by morning, the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department would start the search. Good on you for delegating, we guess. <laughs> Fish and Game Department? It's amazing. I guess they, uh, they're responsible for searching for, like, um, uh, missing people. It's like, what's that other famous one? The Secret Service is also responsible for, like, counterfeit money and shit? Is that right? Or they were originally responsible for counterfeit money and now they are the president's bodyguards, essentially? That's a weird one, isn't it? Why don't we just give them proper names? Like, anti-counterfeiting department. And then bodyguards. Secret Service is a kick-ass name for bodyguards, so we can stick with that. But for the counterfeiting money, why don't they have a different team? A different gang. At 5.17 p.m. on Tuesday, the 10th of February, almost 24 hours after a crash, Haverhill police officers referred to Mora as missing for the first time. Fred Murray arrived in Haverhill before dawn the next morning. At 8 a.m., the Murrays, New Hampshire Fish and Game, and others began the search. A police dog tracked the scent from Mora's glove approximately 100 yards from the car and then lost the scent. The police think that this meant she got into another vehicle. They believed she had come to the area to run away or commit suicide, and hitching a ride would help her reach her destination. At 5 p.m. that night, Billion, it does seem reasonable that she's running away. Like, I would say that that's a distinct possibility. I don't th maybe suicide, but I'd say that's a bit of a stretch. It more just seems like she wants to escape her life. I'm not sure what gives me that vibe. That's the vibe I'm getting. At 5 p.m. that night, Billy and his parents arrived in Haverhill, and Billy turned off his cell phone during the flight because that's what we did before airplane mode existed. And during this time, he received a voicemail. <laughs> yes, there's another thing. People, I really still use voicemail. Like, I was like, I just realized I don't even have voicemail set up on my phone. If someone calls me, they don't get a voicemail. They just get a beep, beep, beep uh, when, you know, it, it times out. And they either have to call me back or send me a text message. And I prefer it that way. Voicemails. When he listened to the voicemail, he heard soft breathing, crying, a whimper, and sniffling. He called the number back and found it was from a prepaid calling card. He was sure this call was from Mora, as she had used those cards frequently in the past for various reasons. Yes, and also, who else is going to be calling him and having a bit of a cry on the phone silently, other than his missing kid? That seems a bit like, of course, that's exactly what you would assume. There were several, how, how how many other calls do you get for people just phoning up and having to cry? There were several more searches, but very little ever came of it. This case captivated people both because it was the first major crime of its type in the social media age, Mora's disappearance happening just five days after Facebook launched. And because there are so many believable possibilities for what happens, Fred became critical of the police and what he saw as their failings. And while he continued to search every weekend for signs of Mora, he made numerous statements claiming that he believed she was abducted by some local dirtbag. The YouTube videos. Oh, here we go. I know something about this. Oh my God, YouTube's old, right? When is this? Was YouTube round in 2003? When was this? Facebook was like 2004? 2005? Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Let's move on. YouTube's old though. It's kind of amazing when you're on there and you're like, when was this video uploaded? 15 years ago. What? <laughs> Before I get to the myriad of theories about what happens more, there's one more thing I wanted to touch on first. On February the 7th, 2012, a user by the name of Mr. 112 Dirtbag uploaded a video titled Mora Murray YouTube.mov. The username is, of course, a reference to Route 112, where Mora crashed her car into Fred calling her presumed abductor a dirtbag. This video is 15 seconds long and it shows a ski pass purchased at Bretton Woods Mountain Resort, located 40 miles from where Mora Mora disappeared. Two days later, on February the 9th, the eighth anniversary of her disappearance, 112 Dirtbag uploaded a video, a second video titled Happy Anniversary. The video shows a close-up of an old bald man with glasses laughing to the camera. As the video progresses, he laughs harder and harder with a maniacal tone. After 52 seconds of this, he abruptly stops laughing, winks at the camera, and then smiles as the video fades out and is replaced with the words Happy Anniversary on screen. I don't think this is actually anyone who perpetrated any sort of crime. The only crime is them being a f***ing weirdo. The third of these videos was titled No Hope for Mental Wannabe and is pretty much just four minutes of the guy who owned the channel playing synthesizer. In the last few seconds of the video, this image appears. Ooh, I do have an image. Uh, it's this. Um, I will explain, audio listeners. It's a 
weirdly drawn creepy ass face um seems to be drawn in microsoft paint and then on the left there's a weird kind of z-shaped poly polygon like uh, shaped with sharp edges with the numbers 1 5 27 and 8 around it it looks weird the right eye momentarily winks and then the video ends the image is intended to correspond with the map with this map of the Bretton woods resort and then below that we have the map that looks like one of those uh skiing maps you get you know where they have the different routes on the ski mountains if you rotate the red polygon slightly the numbers line up with the numbers on the resort map sort of anyway it's a pretty terrible drawing yes it's super creepy the face is believed to represent the golf course on the right number 11 on the map it takes a bit of squinting but if you take the river to be the lips you can okay uh, 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 that that <laughs> i mean <laughs> humans are good at seeing faces in everything and patterns and everything that doesn't look like the face that face is creepy though that face is creepy the first and third videos were each taken down by 112 dirtbag after a day and his entire channel is now deleted speculation immediately rim rampants people believe that this was the killer giving away the location of the body please police don't waste time pursuing this because the problem is even if this is real even if this person actually did put the body out there and you go out there and you i guess spend a lot of money and don't find it or even if you do find it you're going to get a lot of people who copy this behavior who don't know anything about crimes and then it's going to waste a whole ton of money as p police pursue all these crazy leads you've got to have something more to go on the police have got to have something more to go on if they before they investigate this right this is of course not the case the police identified the man in the videos and have ruled him out as a suspect holy shit. okay like so many other people in this video he was just a piece of shit in this video the video we're making which is full of pieces of shit. i'm not even going to write down his name because he's either some sick bastard looking for attention or some absolute lunatic looking for attention based on his other online activity it definitely seems like the latter this was all just a hoax meant to taunt the family and give himself attention because well reasons it did create a spike in attention of Mora's case, which is potentially a good thing, as it's still an open, still an open investigation. So it's good to keep the public's keeping the public's mind in case anyone somehow sees or finds anything. It's just not the way to do it. Still, given the impact it had at the time, I thought it was worth mentioning. Plus it's a creep pretty creepy video the longer mysteries go unsolved the more false leads and hoaxes are bound to turn up i wonder how the police found who the uploader of the video was oh because he showed his face laughing at the camera maniacally <laughs> so they managed to trace him somehow i hope he got some sort of punishment though this seems like you could be potentially wasting police time money the crimes are being a massive bell end the longer mysteries go unsolved the more false leads and hoaxes are bound to turn up and when something gets the attention that dirtbag did there will be copycats as well the most notable of these was another youtube channel created in october 2017 called mora murray loves me the first video posted to the channel was where i put mora and featured a video of a man walking around inside a barn the video is made using an app to make it look like it was filmed on an old vhs camcorder but it's clearly not these people need to get a life the second video was titled the end uh, the video opens up with the words you were too slow then shows a map drawn by a blind three-year-old using ms paint to show you where the body allegedly was sounds like this whole thing was put together by a three-year-old the map is clear enough to be understood but vague enough to be useless it was the equivalent of sticking a thumb tag into the globe and saying this is where i buried the body these videos are largely considered to be disgusting hoaxes but unlike the 112 dirtbag videos the creator has not been identified and investigated so it is technically evidence but it's unlikely yeah it's super ridiculous and unlikely don't spend any money on it don't spend any thoughts on it this is not the answer i mean not you spending money on the police unless it'd be a bit, why, why would you be why would you bring that up simon why would people listening be spending money on this <laughs> what are you talking about the theories so 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 many theories there are so many details known about mora leading up to her disappearance but so little known after that seemingly every theory can be made to feel like it has some sort of validity this is the biggest problem as with no real evidence following her disappearance it's hard to disprove most of these theories you don't have to disprove them you just the, it's on the it's the responsibility of the people with the theories to prove them right i mean you can't disprove a ton of stuff 
Most of the theories I'm going to present have a large number of variations to them, but we aren't going to go into detail on every iteration that has been put forth over the past 18 years. Number 1. Starting a new life The first theory is that Mora was running away to start a new life. Some people propose the alleged pregnancy angle as a, participate, a precipitating factor, but there's nothing substantive to lead to the belief that she was or even thought that she was pregnant. Considering she bought her, brought her birth control pills with her for the trip, it seems highly unlikely. Still, she may have just been trying to start over. As we discussed, Mora had been engaging in increasingly risky and impulsive behavior. In addition to her shoplifting and identity theft, she was also now potentially on the hook for DUI, a charge that would prevent her previous case from being dismissed. Either by luck or through desperation, she managed to avoid a field sobriety test, but she was not necessarily in the clear. It's pretty crazy how by avoiding a field sobriety test, it, you're, you get less, you're less likely to be uh, charged with a crime. <laughs> It's literally sending the message if you have an accident, run away. <laughs> Boom! Go, go, go! I'm super drunk. There was also other impulsive behavior. She had reportedly been involved in a relationship with the assistant coach of the track team and was rumored to have slept with several other members of the track team, as well as potentially others like the guy at the party, the Friday before she disappeared. As I said back then, who she sleeps with is really none of our concern, except that it was believed to be out of character for her. This led to many, this led many to believe that she might have been experiencing early symptoms of developing bipolar disorder and that manic episodes were causing her risky behaviors. If true, it was never diagnosed, but she was at the right age for onset to occur. People in extended manic episodes have reported the desire to just give up and walk away from everything as well. While there is definitely evidence to support the theory she was suffering from mental illness, we are not licensed professionals who are qualified to make that determination. And if we were, we would understand that it is unethical for us to diagnose without the inability to talk to her. She may have showed symptoms of a burgeoning bipolar disorder, but that's about as much as we can say. Yeah, I mean, of course we can't make a diagnosis, but it does seem if that was something that's... I worry there's always that, is it out of character according to her family, or is it out of character according to her friend group? Because, I don't know, there are certain things you don't tell your family. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like uh sex 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 and violence sex sex uh yeah and so maybe it was more in character than they thought i don't know but also the the bipolar disorder does sound entirely reasonable there's also the matter of billy while it's none of our business who maura chooses to sleep with as a bo boyfriend billy would absolutely think it was his business fair enough i hate to keep going back to this well but it turns out billy is also also a giant piece of shit, allegedly he was reportedly very controlling and would call maura constantly to check up on her i mean <laughs> Uh, if he's her boyfriend, is it controlling to be like, uh, pl uh, I'd rather you didn't sleep with other dudes? Um, and it sounds like he actually had a reason to be concerned because she was? Is that? I don't know. If she didn't answer her phone, he would call whatever friends she had said she was going with to make sure she wasn't lying. Okay, that's already not cool, my dude. <laughs> that's not cool. Already he's not a cool guy. <laughs> Kevin and I same page, but things have only gotten worse. Here are some of the alleged highlights about Billy. A few months after Maura's disappearance, Billy was heading to a hotel with a girl he picked up at a party. At a red light, he allegedly reached over, grabbed her by the neck, and said, I'm going to kill you like I killed Maura. Holy sh**, dude, what are you up to? In 2011, Billy was fired from his job for allegedly sexually assaulting a woman in the office on St. Patrick's Day. In Val on Valentine's Day of 2018, Billy had to call 911 because his mistress received a contusion to her head. Billy killed her. Right now, I'm like, oh my god, Billy killed her. He said he killed her. He has a history of violence. I'd make a joke about spending Valentine's Day with his mistress, but I'm guessing his wife was happy not to spend it with him in 2019 billy's mistress won a civil protection order after he began stalking her in which he was ordered to pay for her security system and attend 22 domestic violence classes the felony sexual assault case from 2011 is finally to begin proceedings well by the time this episode drops they will have probably begun all of these things are so far allegations. Only the one civil suit has gone to trial. Other women have come forward about Billy as well, though I believe all were past the statute of limitations. Okay, there we go. The common themes in these reports, however, is that he liked to have his victims pretend to be Mora, and whether they played along or not, he enjoyed choking them, calling them Mora, and calling them names like and and always ending the encounters with the sentence, This never happened. Billy, you 
fucking psycho. I would like to reiterate, these are allegations, and he has not yet been convicted as a sexual criminal. Not yet, and he might not be. Uh, because my editorial opinion is not meant to be taken as a session of fact, I would also like to reiterate that Billy is indeed a giant piece of shit, in Kevin's opinion. And look, let me chime in in this. In my opinion, does rather seem to be, doesn't he? In my opinion, as an individual, this is nothing based on fact. I don't know him. But he does seem like a bell, doesn't he? Even if I were stating that as fact and not as an opinion, in order to prove defamation, someone would have to prove that my statement was false. And good luck with that one. <laughs> Given all these alleged allegations and one writer's personal opinion, it would not be a surprise if Mora wanted to escape. The track coach, with whom she had been having a relationship, also claims she confided in him that she wanted to run away and start a new life, and that Billy's controlling nature was one of those reasons. All of this seems to add up fully. Like, even the excessive drinking because of stress and pressure and wanting to go away and start a new life. I'm like, this seems to be what happens, and then obviously at some point something goes terribly wrong. That all speaks to her motivation, but the theory is that she succeeded. Some versions of, oh yeah, of course it could go totally right. But I don't think she's competent enough for it to go totally right, and for her to never be discovered. Because disappearing has got to be really hard. Like, I've seen Breaking Bad, it costs loads of, although he was really wanted by the police, not for like a DUI but for being a massive criminal. Um, but I still think it's really hard to disappear, isn't it? Especially in today's world, you need like ID and shit. Some versions of this theory state that she did it alone, and others claim that, she claimed that she was aided by her father. This was helped early on by a number of reported sightings of Mora in Vermont and Canada, though I believe most, if not all, of these sightings have been discredited. Suggestions as to how she escaped, especially how she managed to disappear completely in such a short window of time before the cops arrived, and despite two neighbors looking out of their windows very wildly. Which brings us to the next theory. The Tandem Driver this theory purports that there was someone driving with her to her destination in a separate vehicle. Either they were lagging behind and drove up on the accident, or they were in the lead and doubled back after seeing that she was no longer behind them. This theory has several variations as well. It was a friend helping her escape to a new life. It was someone she was going on a romantic getaway with, or it was multiple other people and they were all going to get drunk and party for a few days. No matter what the variation, they all had one thing in common. There's not really any evidence to suggest this. Aside from the awkward situation of taking two cars for some reason, it isn't great at explaining how she disappeared sight unseen. I don't know. Taking two cars kind of makes sense though. Like, and every t every time I went to like go or go to like a party or go to a place, like, I mean, not now. I'm a family man and stuff. It's like obviously just go with my family. But like back in the day, if I was going to a party or something, I was like, no, I want to drive. Because I want to be able to leave when I want. I don't want to have to rely on a friend for a lift home who's like still drunk the next day and just like, oh, I don't, I can't drive just yet. I can't drive. I, I don't feel good. I'm drunk. And then it's like, you don't end up leaving. Like, this was such a bane. It's such a pain in the ass. It's like four o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday and you're like, yo, can we go home now? <laughs> Whereas I'd always be like, no, I got my own car. I'm not going to get super faced and I'm going to drive home nice and early so I can enjoy my Sunday. That's why people take two cars. That's why I would take my own car. Whoever was driving with her had to have been far enough away that they did not arrive at the crash for several minutes after the bus driver had already rolled up on Mora and left, but was not so far away that the cops got there first. Considering Mora had printed out two different sets of map quests again, this was 2004 <laughs> directions indicating that at least she did not know how to get where she was going it would stand to reason that she would either follow the other car or the other car would follow her and her directions oh my god i just realized i remember printing out i don't think it was map quest but google early google maps and you'd print out directions and they'd have like the different steps and i'd remember having these on my passenger seat to be like okay go here go here i mean i get that people used to read maps in the past but that was I never had map reading. And then TomTom Tom came along. I don't know if you had TomToms in America. They were like these devices that you stick on your windshield. Like before we all did like on our phone or like Garmin. Garmin's another one. I feel like that's maybe more American. Like I never hear TomTom Tom mentioned in movies, but Garmin. And then they came along and they were like a hundred pounds or something. I was like, I'm not buying that. But I'd borrow my parents at every opportunity. In either situation, it seems unlikely that they would have wound up separated by long enough of a distance for the crash and the encounter with Butch to take place. Plus, if Mora were driving with another car on such a long journey, it's hard to believe there would have been no phone calls between the two. The crash happened at roughly three hours into the drive. 
If it were me, there's no way I would have made it that long without calling the other car to figure out where to stop and take a piss or grab some food. This theory really only explains how she vanished from the scene of the accident, and it doesn't even explain that very well. Yeah, when the dog lost the trail early on, she could have just got a lift with someone else. Like she could have hitchhiked or whatever. This that seems like a more likely explanation than like, yeah, they were all going together. It's like, but there's no evidence of that. It just seems like you made up a crazy theory. Not a crazy theory, a reasonable theory, but there's just no evidence to support it, and it just doesn't seem that likely. Butch did it. Gonna claw oh, wait, I've forgotten who Butch is. <laughs> We're going to gloss over this one quickly and with good cause. There are some out there that think Butch, the bus driver who showed up to the accident, did it. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, he abducted Moore in his school bus, drove to his home where his wife was, and then called the police and spent the night searching for her while with them either dead or tied up on the school bus in his driveway, a hundred yards from the scene of the crime. With his wife still home, that's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. That didn't happen. <laughs> You'd yeah, have to be a massive idiot. Maybe he is a massive idiot, but I don't think so. And again, there's no f***ing evidence for this. Poor Butch. <laughs> he was the good guy. <laughs> Number four, abducted by a stranger. Another possibility is that after Butch drove off, Mora was abducted by a stranger driving by. There are a couple of ways that this could have gone down. She may have started taking off on foot when police dogs were brought in and given the scent from her gloves. They followed it 100 yards from the car before losing the trail. 100 yards in the opposite direction of Butch's house. Well, there we go. <laughs> It wasn't Butch, was it? Someone or someones in a passing car could have pulled up and abducted her, or she could have gotten into the car willingly. Yes. There was only a seven minute window, and this would have either uh, have to have been someone extremely opportunistic or someone who had been following her, possibly after she stopped somewhere nearby for a bathroom break. Butch had noted that he could no longer see the crash from his house when he called the police, but that several cars drove down the road. Something that makes this slightly more credible is the possibility that after declining help from Butch, Mora realized that the police would be there soon, either because she suspected he was going to ignore her request not to call the cops and do it anyway, or because she realized one of the other residents of the area may have already done it. She may have also wanted to ride all along to escape a potential, a potential DUI, and just wanted to get in a vehicle that wasn't a school bus being driven by a 300 pound man this one is sounding super reasonable this one seems like the most likely i mean she has to have gotten away from somewhere assuming that the police dog was you know competent smelling shit which i assume it is um this one seems super credible so far one of the main arguments used to refute this theory is the tight window and how extremely coincidental it would have been for a killer to happen to drive by get in her car and disappear especially if she was taken by force yeah i feel that's extremely un like Obviously, this is a thing that serial killers do, or killers do. They abduct people like this. But also for all of the mysterious stuff that was happening before and all the weird stuff to just combine with this rather than it being a completely normal situation just seems super unlikely. I think she got in the car willingly. I don't think she was murdered in the car. But obviously, she disappears at some point, right? So what happened? Oh, I kind of disappointed that. Well, I mean, I know it's not solved, but now I'm like, I want to know what happens. <laughs> Stupid. This ignores the fact that such an act may have been completely premeditated. Uh, I'm not contending that someone had conspired to abduct Mora specifically, just that they planned to abduct someone. The road was notoriously dangerous, and there had just been a major storm, making it even more treacherous. All the killer would have to do is hide somewhere nearby and wait. If this happens, the abduction was clean, like that of an experienced serial killer. To that end, five weeks later in Montgomery, Vermont, less than 90 miles away, 17-year-old Brianna Maitland disappeared in almost identical circumstances circumstances a car was found crashed on the side of the road and no trace of brianna was ever found the police immediately dismissed the idea of a serial killer and deemed the incidents unrelated uh i wouldn't be doing that that seems like exactly the same circumstances why would you do that while there is no firm evidence of a serial killer even if mora is dead or just made herself disappear in january 2022 she was added to the fbi violent criminal apprehension profile the VICAP registry is a database of victims of serial killers and local law enforcement agencies can request that missing persons and other potential victims be added to that database as well. Actually, the abduction thing, I mean, with that serial killer thing going on nearby, I'm like, well, that doesn't sound that unlikely, does it? That seems entirely plausible. I mean, it's a lot pl more plausible than some of the other stuff. Suicide 
It's unclear exactly what Mora's plan was upon leaving UMass, or how concrete a plan she even had. There are several signs to point to the fact that she may have planned to commit suicide. She had tidied up her room, packing everything into boxes. She had made sure to return a borrowed lab coat to a fellow student, even though they had insisted she didn't need to yet. The tidying up of personal affairs like this is consistent with people who intend to commit suicide. Her potential destinations were places of comfort for her, like the condos where her family vacationed, or the White Mountains where she and her father had hiked. These, oh no, this is going to be the most likely option, isn't it? That's sad. These are the sorts of destination, and also with the mental, the mental stuff, the mental difficulties. Oh man, this is probably the option, isn't it? That's kind of a bummer. I was kind of, I mean, obviously, I don't want to hope she was abducted. I don't know why that's sadder. I guess because it's so much more like it's a failure of, like, a serial killer is, yeah, sure, it's a failure of law enforcement, but it's also like fucking psycho serial killers are fucking being psychos. Whereas suicide's like more a failure of the system. It's like a failure of her support group and the health service and whatever to like make sure she's okay. I feel, is, is that, that doesn't make sense. That, I should be sad, it should be sadder if she gets killed by a serial killer, right? Or is it make? I don't know. Look, let's just leave it alone. I'm, am I making at all any sense? These are the sorts of destinations that someone would choose for that occasion. Along with the other items I mentioned inside her car, there was also a bottle of sleeping pills, reportedly Tylenol PM. Combining sleeping pills and alcohol is a common form of suicide. I'd love to know more concrete numbers on how common, but Google has decided to preempt all my searches into the matter by telling me that help is available by giving me the phone number for the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Thanks for looking out for me, business daddy. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of with Google on that one. Um, I think most people, I don't know, not most people, but people Googling that probably do need to be presented with the uh, National Suicide Prevention Hotline, which I like. While there is a case to be made for this argument, and at the very beginning Fred Murray reportedly considered it a possibility, there's also evidence that it either that either it wasn't Mora's plan or that she had not yet decided. Among the personal effects she brought with her were her birth control pills, which indicates long-term planning, uh, or habitual behavior. Uh, she also picked up the accident report forms to fill out for her father, though she may have intended to fill those out and mail them. While there may have been questions about her mental state, it's important to note that taking off like this wasn't completely unprecedented. Her friend said that one day in high school, she decided just to hop on the train to Boston instead of going to school just for the hell of it. Oh my god, I wish I had the balls to have done that. Like, <laughs> I love Ferris Bueller's Day Off. That is such a brilliant movie, and I'm always like, God damn. I was just always, I'm just a, I'm just a coward. I'm like, I would, I never did that. I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever intentionally bunked off school, which is what we call it in the UK when you, uh, playing truant. I don't think I was ever truant from school. And I kind of regret it. I know I'd have got into trouble, but, and they'd always be like, well, that's going to go on your record. The record, all of that kind of shit is just something you realize when you're an adult doesn't matter at all. Like nothing what you do as a child really matters. I mean, I guess it does sometimes. Like... But only when you're a bit older. It's not like skipping school is gonna fuck up your career. I'm not saying people should skip school, but maybe just once. Just fuck up for the day. Get on the train. Go somewhere else. Deal with the consequences. Don't show your parents this if you're listening it afterwards. I'm not endorsing this. I'm just saying it's something that I probably regret doing because then instead of telling you about how I'm a coward, I'll be telling you a cool story like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Wouldn't I? I'm not saying do this. <laughs> Nor am I. I don't know. <laughs> Stop it, Simon. It's hardly a pattern of behavior, but the fact that there is prior evidence of her saying, F this noise and just going away on her own with no warning is a reasonable indication that her decision that February was not the result of a full-on mental breakdown. Along the lines of suicide is the theory that she went off into the woods and succumbed to the elements. That is going to be a body found. I already thought about this. I'm like, someone's going to find that. Although America's really big, and there's probably not that many... No, Vermont's, Vermont's nature and stuff, but it's small. I've got a friend from Vermont. I've got a couple of friends from Vermont. And I think it's small, but I know there's a lot of nature because they're always talking about how much nature there is in Vermont. The witness who claimed months later to have seen her jogging down the road four to five miles from the crash site said that she turned down a dirt road when she saw him approach. It's possible that she ran off, got lost, and died of exposure, but given how frequently and thoroughly the area was searched, it's unlikely that her remains would not have been found. Number six, the A-frame house. On a personal note, I really hate the name of this theory. It's called the A-frame house because the roof, ha the house has an angled roof resembling the letter A. 
Know what other building has this style of roof? Every single f***ing house in the entirety of New England and most of America. If our houses had flat roofs, they'd all bend, leak, and even collapse under the weight of the heavy snow accumulation. Rant over. I feel like flat roofs are not very common. But, right? Like, because it's like, well, there's going to be snow and shit on them. That's not good. Although then you can have a roof deck, which is cool. That's pretty cool. I, uh, my, uh, I have a little holiday house and the uh, entire roof, not the entire roof, but most of it's flat. So why is there never a snow problem up there? I'm just thinking about that now. It snows heavily where it is, but it's never an issue and I don't know why. Fascinating. It's probably just built really strong. I guess that's how they do it. But uh, it's really nice to sit up there because it's just this big open deck. It's cool. Fascinating story, Simon. On to the theory itself. The particular house was about half a mile from the crash site and was the home of Claude Moulton, age 38, and his girlfriend of four years, age 18. In 2004, Fred Murray received a knife in the mail from Claude's brother, Larry. <laughs> okay. Claude and his girlfriend had been said to be have been acting strangely after Maura's disappearance, and Larry believed that the bloodstained knife he found in Claude's gov box was used to kill her. The police had originally refused the knife when Fred offered it to them as evidence, but they later accepted it. Family members claimed that Larry had a history of drug use and made the story up to try and get reward money. Still a few days later, Fred was given the knife, Claude scrapped his car, and he had previously refused to let the police search his property. This is really weird and random. Law enforcement never received Law enforcement never released any information about the knife, most likely because even if it was tested and found to have Mora's DNA on it, there was no proper chain of custody and it would not have been able to have been used to establish probable cause for a warrant. Really? That's not enough? There's no way to verify. If I was a judge, I'd be like, Fuck yeah, get into that guy's house searching for a body. What have you got to lose? There was no way to verify the knife was found in the glove box, and even if it was, there's no way to know what happened between then and it being received by the police. If Larry's story is true, then it's more than a little disappointing the police could not act, but not as disappointing as it would have been to find a treasure trove of evidence that would have been thrown out of court for an illegal search and seizure. So do it legally. Go get it. Find that body. With such a high-profile case, I can't fault the police for wanting to play this one by the book to avoid losing a conviction on a technicality. Then again, even if the evidence couldn't be used in court there's no justice like angry mob justice except there is through the courts legally i don't think anyone's gonna like go over to the house and murder these people they're just gonna be like known as the pieces of shit who got away with murder claude and his girlfriend eventually left town and the new owners of the a-frame house allowed it to be investigated cadaver dogs were brought in and they were very insistent about a particular closet in the house indicating the possibility of human remains while carpet samples were to be tested for blood and human remains the investigation was being run by the murray's private investigator john smith not by law enforcement the samples were given to the new hampshire state police and they had again and they have again not made any comments regarding this evidence maybe call the cops when the dogs go nuts instead of just taking the samples yourself the floors and carpets have since been replaced uh, i'm like this is a bit of a stretch isn't it there was a knife found in a glove box the guy was behaving strangely that's all they don't know they should have f-ing tested the knife because even if it's not used in court i would like to know and uh the the, the dogs the cadaver dogs smelling at the cupboard it's like i don't know how accurate are those cadaver dogs does that they just smell dead people Maybe it was another dead person. Maybe it wasn't a dead person at all. Maybe it was a... I don't know. Whatever. Ten years later, in 2016, John Smith returned to the house. I like these called John Smith. <laughs> Who is John Smith again? He's the private investigator. It's the most... Gene- ah, wait. John Smith is like... Uh, why is it, is it John Smith? Or is it Joe Bloggs? Like, we have our... In the UK, we have our own equivalent of John Doe. And I can't remember if it's... I think it's Joe Bloggs, actually. But John Smith is also a super generic name. The house was now, uh, they returned to the host uh, with the host of a podcast dedicated to Maura Murray. That's kind of fun. I mean, morbid, but I, <laughs> I feel like such a lame podcast host. I just sit in my house, <laughs> sit in my office, record some videos. I don't go outside even. The house was now abandoned, so they went upstairs to the closet again and took wood chips to be tested. This time, they were tested privately rather than being handed over to the police. The wood chips from the closet tested positive for human blood. There were two sets of DNA, one male and one unidentifiable, which means that it cannot be ruled out that it's more as blood. Unfortunately, barring significant advances in technology, that is as far as we can be de- that is as much as can be determined from the degraded samples. Throughout the course of researching and writing this, I did not have any agenda or theory that I wanted to put forward. My goal is always to state the facts. Still, if we're on the same page that this is a very clear front runner for most likely theory, be sure to get into the comments 
and let me know. Oh, dude, I don't know if I'm on the same page with you about this. I don't know if I'm on the same page, Kevin. I think... Oh, but then where did she go? Okay, here's what I think is the most likely theory. And it's a sad theory. They're all sad theories because she's probably dead. Um, Is she had the car crash. She wanted to run away. She started heading up the road. A car comes past. She puts out her thumb. She gets in the car. She hitchhikes to the nearest town where she commit suicide and in a place where her body won't necessarily be found i don't know jumping into a river something like this that's my theory that's my front runner i think the d de- the blood and stuff it's like i don't know although who has blood stains that's like really intense like of course like people cut themselves and stuff but then it's not like the stain stays there in the cupboard forever and why would it be in a cupboard something suspicious happened there I don't know if it's my front runner though. Patrice Vassy. On Friday, February 6th, 2004, at approximately 2.15 a.m., UMass student Petrit Vassy was struck by a car a few minutes off campus in a hit and run. He was in a coma for a month. This was the same night that Mora had her 1 a.m. breakdown. There is already a solid foundation for why she may have wanted to get away, but there are some who believe that Mora was the one who struck Vassy. Mora's shift that night was from 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. It's expected that for a six-hour shift, she would get some sort of break. By Massachusetts state law, she would be offered a 30-minute meal break. She can waive that right, but if they they did not offer any other breaks, then it is unlikely she would. With the snowstorm coming that night, she could have planned to use her break to run to the store and grab some food or liquor to stock up for the impending snow day from classes. If she took her break at midnight, a very logical time to take one in an 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. shift. Nah, I'd take it earlier. Would I? I don't know. I always would want to wait and then take my break as late as possible. But then there are other times you're like, yeah, but then but then it doesn't really break it up very much, does it? I'd want to do it close to the middle, maybe slightly after the middle. Because if you take it at 12, this is not interesting at all. <laughs> I'm just going to stop talking about taking breaks at work. It's not interesting. I'm sorry. While the parking lot her car would have been in was a 14-minute walk away, Mora was a track athlete up against a ticking clock. Running or jogging to her car could have been easily could have done it in half that time. She had a phone call with Billy that began at 12.07 a.m. and lasted for seven minutes. The area where Vassie was hit was approximately a six-minute drive from her parking lot. If either, sh- if either the drive took her slightly longer or she was on the phone with Billy for a minute before getting into the car, getting the car into drive that could put her in the area distracted on the phone at the time of the hit and run at that point she would have ditched her plans to pick up whatever vittles vittles i don't know that word i guess supplies she had intended drive back to uh, drive back to a closer parking lot right next to her work and either cut her break short or take five minutes or so to settle herself before going back inside. At 12.40 a.m., Moore received a phone call from an unknown caller on a campus phone. This could have been anything from a casual, hey, did you go up and downtown? To, uh, from someone who informed her that the accident was much more severe than she realized, to someone who witnessed the incident and intended to blackmail her. This entire account of events is absolutely plausible, and it gives a much better explanation for why she was sobbing, followed by a catatonic state, than it resulting from the conversation with her sister over two hours earlier. This seems legit, doesn't it? But again, there's no evidence. There's no really strong evidence. It's just like super circumstantial. But that feels like that's the sort of reaction you'd have to that that phone call, right? Vassy has absolutely no recollection. Oh, he survived. I don't know why I assume he died. That's great. Oh, he's in a coma for a month, of course. And then, <laughs> you read this like two minutes ago, Whistle. He had no idea who hit him, and he had never met Mora prior. Not that this would have been targeted or anything, just a careless accident from driving while on the phone. Oh my god. Mora, you crashed two cars because you're drunk in two days and also hit and run? Holy shit. But it sounds like he's a bit sick of being asked about it. If she was somehow involved, we'll never know. The only other person who would possibly know is Billy, and given what we know about him, I would not consider him a credible source of information. One of the major driving forces pushing this theory forward is the belief that Fred helped his daughter run away. It's a possible explanation for why neither of them mentioned shopping for a car in front of Kate at dinner. I can't imagine a father that would go to the lengths it would take to help his daughter start a new life and then lie about it very publicly, including multiple national television appearances, would be the same father than that seemingly encouraged her to drive the car home drunk the day after she had had such a traumatic experience 
that she needed to run away from. Ultimately, while I include this section because the potential connection to Vassy has been receiving increased attention, so I feel obliged to, I think it's ultimately immaterial. Mora already had a desire to run away and start a new life, and not without cause. This would absolutely have added an increased sense of urgency, but there's no way to know that February 9th would have been the day wouldn't have been the day that she ran away whether this happened or not wrap up this is an ongoing investigation with a lot of attention focused on it so much of the information in this is a bit of a moving target people's stories have changed new developments have come out and details included in this script may have changed between the time of writing and the time that you're watching or listening to it. What I can say is this. Maura Murray it was a talented but troubled girl who decided to pack her things and get away. Maybe for a week, maybe forever. Her true intentions and the details of what happened may never be known. It is my opinion that after crashing her car while drunk, an offense she couldn't risk due to her present legal situation, she likely declined the help of a kindly but off-putting stranger and instead chose to accept a ride from a younger couple with whom she felt more safe. Unfortunately for her, looks can be deceiving, whether by negligence, incompetence, or much more likely by a strict adherence to evidentiary rules, important leads were seemingly never followed up on, and the potential evidence was destroyed or became unusable. Maybe I'm wrong. If an infamous bank robber can escape capture for 50 years, spending most of that time living five minutes away from me, who's to say that Mora too couldn't have escaped and found a peaceful life somewhere as well? I think it's super unlikely, Kevin, sadly. <laughs> Sadly, although I don't think she was murdered, I think she uh, probably committed suicide. Um, yeah, interesting. Kevin's on a different page from me. Let me know. I wish we could do like polls in the comments. I'd be super interested in where people come down on this one. Uh, also, I uh, you already know this, but I've made the decision to publish this on Casual Criminalist because this is clearly a Casual Criminalist script. So, right now I'm going to say goodbye to you and then I'm going to record a new intro to this video, which you've already seen. Isn't video weird? Thank you for watching. Rate, review, subscribe, like, all of that stuff. And I'll see you next time.